Well, hello. And if you're listening to this in the morning, good morning, as I'm recording this in the early morning. Today, we are talking about Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 to 13. I'm Pastor Nanette Christofferson, and along with Pastor Steve Talmadge, we offer these short Bible studies on our lectionary readings. We are in lectionary year A, and we are in the fourth week of Pentecost. As we get started with today's study, let's think about Jeremiah a little bit, and uh, I offer you a little background just in case it's been a while since you've thought about the prophet Jeremiah. According to what's written in the book of Jeremiah, his prophecy and work as God's spokesperson spanned over 40 years, from the 13th year of Josiah's reign in 627 to the captivity of Jerusalem in 587. These were very difficult years for the people of Israel um, as they kept thinking that they would be able to defeat uh, the Assyrians and then the Babylonians come into power and uh, really just take over uh, their world. And so um, he's addressing the turbulent, these turbulent times and the concerns of the Jewish refugees in Babylon. It can be hard for us to imagine what it would be like to be a refugee or to be held under captivity of a government in which you don't, um, in which you do not want to conform to. And I think I want to point out a few cataclysmic losses that the Israelites faced, the Jewish community faced through this captivity because their life in this captivity changed really forever and how they did some of the things that they had been doing. They um, had a loss of control and power and the questioning of time honored practices and traditions came to mind and how they might have to change how they do things. And we all know how difficult it is when it comes to our own practices and traditions and how difficult it is to change. Cultural and religious categories were once well-defined now lacked clarity. The po process of power distribution once precisely arranged in hierarchical structures of a dynastic state was now ill-defined. They found themselves living on the edge and at risk, negotiating a new world in the shadow of unspeakable loss. So let's take a look at Jeremiah 20, 7 to 13. And in this um, part, this section, he is lamenting and he's lamenting um, the difficulty it is to be a prophet the difficult um, job that he has ahead of, of what there is all involved as a prophet. And I think any of us, if we study a prophet long enough, we will realize the difficult job that they have. And we also know that no one would more than likely put themselves in this situation unless it was God working through them because they knew that this is what they must do. as what God, God has called them to do. Jeremiah writes, O oh Lord, you have enticed me and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me, for whenever I speak, I must cry out, I must shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot, for I hear many whisperings. Terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed, and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble, and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise to the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evildoers. One of the things that I personally like a lot about Jeremiah is he's not afraid to name and grieve the massive loss. This book is replete with candor and passionate expression. It is replete with voices of shock, protest, regret, and anguish. Jeremiah claims that hope and survival are possible when people are willing to face the real world of human suffering and its many distorted postures of evil. 
As we think about this, I think oftentimes we are not willing to face the real world of human suffering um, in our world today as well, because denial is so much easier. Turning our back or having a blind spot is so much easier than facing the reality of human suffering. And not only is that true today, but this was true 2,500 years ago. This call for such brutal honesty may at first seem to have little to do with hope, but Jeremiah claims that truth-telling is the first step to healing and wholeness. The book dares to speak of an utter array of experiences too painful for many to utter. James Lindbergh writes in his 2008 commentary on Jeremiah. He writes, here, indeed, we learn what faith really is, not that smug faith which is untroubled by questions because it has never asked any, but that true faith which has asked all the questions and received very few answers, yet has heard the command, gird up your loins, do your duty, remember your calling, cast yourself forward upon God. I really appreciate what James Lindbergh wrote because faith requires us to question so that we can grow deeper. And yet oftentimes we don't receive the answers or the answers we do receive, we don't wanna hear. Um, so the, the, the part of faith that is so important for all of us is to remember that if we don't ask questions of our faith, we really won't grow and we really won't grow in trust in God and um, grow in understanding of God. As we take a look at the laments of Jeremiah, our reading today is one of a half dozen texts known as the Confessions or better, laments of Jeremiah. While outwardly the prophet appeared as a wall of bronze, these laments reveal something of the turmoil he was experiencing within. He had not wanted the job in the first place and claimed the Lord had seduced him into it. His own family and friends had turned against him. He found himself alone, unable to enjoy good times. He went so far as to wish he'd never been born. And whose fault was all this? Jeremiah did not hesitate to place the blame for his dire circumstances on the God who had called him to task in this first place, accusing God as being deceitful as a mirage in the desert. Perhaps sometimes we too have felt um, some of this lament that Jeremiah feels, that if we, we know that if we are to bring up the subject of God or Jesus to loved ones or family or certain friends, that ears will automatically close and we will be um, dismissed immediately. And I think some of us know that that's what could happen, so we often avoid that. And Jeremiah is bold. He's bold in uh, teaching and spreading and help trying to help people understand what God is asking of them. I also think it's important that we think about lament and how do we define it? And do we are we willing to go into a prayer of lament? This is not only helpful for all of us as Christians, but it's a way of processing, and it's a way of processing grief in God's presence. Many Christians have grown up in churches, you know, that always look like they're on the bright side of things. And when we think about lament then, if you've only grown up on the bright side, or I call it the theology of glory, lament can be jarring. But lament looks forward and restores hope. It presents us with the opportunity to look up to God and activates our memory by reminding us of countless testimonies that not only tell us who he is, but also reveals his heart towards us. One of the things that we are reminded in Lament that you won't have to go it alone. And Jesus reminds, that, reminds us of this too. No one ever said that the Christian life was going to be a rose garden, right? We all know that the Christian life is filled with its own valleys and mountains and that there will certainly be troubles on our path. Psalm 69 is another um, individual lament that you might want to look up, and it's one of our readings for this week as well. And we see that the psalmist here, um, it's designed, the lament is designed for one who is drowning in sorrows and trouble, insulted by enemies and relatives, the subject of gossip, crying to God's rescue, and the situation sounds very much like Jeremiah's life. If we turn to our reading, our gospel reading this week in Matthew 10, 24, 39, it's a portion of one of Jesus's major discourses. 
Jesus assumes those whom he is addressing will face death and strong opposition. He declares that discipleship comes with a cost, a cost with its emphasis on tr a cost that is a cross, and its emphasis is on trials and troubles. Jeremiah 27 to 13 fits in with these other lectionary texts very well for this week. So what particular word does this text bring? There will be times in every person as we try living a responsible life with God that we'll run into unbearable and tragic situations. And at such times, one may have to say, Lord, you got me into this mess. Now get me out of it. When Paul was fearful about continuing his missionary work, there was that same promise. When any one of us stands at the edge of one's life, dark valley, the psalmist prayer can be ours, for you are with me. The ancient Christian greeting, which remains a part of our greeting and wish for one another, says it all. The Lord be with you. The last words of Jesus to his disciples were, and I am with you always to the end of the age. That's a promise. You won't have to go it alone. So as we think about Jeremiah and this lament, can you relate to Jeremiah? I think there's probably all of us have times in our lives where we can relate to Jeremiah. And then what qualities do you admire about Jeremiah? What are things that you admire? One of the things I admire is his relationship with God and his obedience to God. I admire that when the times got rough, that he was willing to lay it out there for God and not be afraid and to, to just say, God, you got me into this mess. And God, you enticed me. You know, I think that that's such interesting language. You enticed me. You uh, lured me in, Lord. And what does that mean? Does lured in mean like you showed me love in a way that lured me, that I want to tell others um, what you need me to say? And if you were to write a lament, what would you write? And I think writing a lament is really important. I've written them sometimes in my journaling and sometimes just, um, just to let out frustration and lay it out before God in a way that maybe I might not say it, but writing it helps. Um, so I'd like you to think about a lament and how a lament um, oftentimes, while you're spilling it out, is actually drawing you closer and helping you um, open up to God's healing presence. And I think that's what a lament does. It opens your soul up so that you can reveal it to God. Not that God doesn't already know it, but there's something about the action of doing it that helps and uh, is, a, is another way of building a relationship with God. And also, I think another way psychologically, we would say of helping us to um, in our emotional state. Well, I hope you have an opportunity this week to write a lament. Um, and, and see God's good response in all of that and, and how it may help you. It may be a lament that never gets answered. Um, and it may be a lament that surprises you of something that you didn't know was bothering you still as you begin to write. May God's blessings be over you this week and uh, as you journey towards um, Sunday. And may you have time to spend some time in Jeremiah and to think about lament and write one. God's blessings to you this week.